kind of what uh, what the governments are doing, and that leads to one big question. So the big the big question for this uh, for this talk really is how big should government be? So you can consider to to start getting at this question. You can, you can ask yourself about two extremes, right? So, so let's consider two extremes, and I think we're all going to be able to agree that neither of these extremes would be a very good outcome if we had either of these. So one of the extremes is no government, no taxes, no spending. Zero. Okay, so what are some problems that would occur during if we, if we did that? If we had no government, no taxes, no spending. Go ahead. Okay, so, yeah, so, so I heard no law enforcement, no defense. That's sort of problem number one, right? So, I mean, there's the only way that one could defend oneself would be by arming oneself privately or organizing private, you know, private defense for yourself. Going to be pretty, pretty tough, so that's thing number one. Yeah, what else? Let's, let's list a few things. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, so great. So who's going to enforce our, uh, you know, our contracts, right? Who enforces contracts? If I write a contract with you to make sure that, um, uh, that, I, you know, that I'm protecting my property, that you're not going to take my property. Say, let's suppose I you know, uh, sign something to buy a, buy a house from you. Okay, will you sign a contract? Uh, and uh, that contract then says that you know, you're going to uh, leave the house when it's time for me to go in to occupy the house. Um, if we have literally no courts or no government, there might be actually no way of enforcing the fact that you've said that you're going to do that, other than I would have to hire a private army or something to, to kick you out of the house. So, so, that, so that's, that, you know, that, these are some really fundamental things where if we had no government, no taxes, no spending, we actually couldn't even really protect private property. So that's really, that's really good. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so all of our roads will become private. Now, you said something interesting there, and that's where we're going to get into a lot of these justifications for government spending. You say, well, we'd have to pay a toll on every road. Well, it's true. Right now, we have to pay the government taxes, and then we trust them to build the roads, or we kind of monitor them and hope that they're building the roads well, and we look and say, okay, are the roads, are they, are they keeping up the roads? Are they spending the money well? So we would have to have, to your point, we would have to have private provision of a lot of different, uh, you know, uh, types of things that are currently provided by uh, government, uh, primary and secondary education. A lot of the things actually on these slides that we, that we just saw, right? all, basically all of these things would all have to be provided privately. And the question that you should ask when you think about what is the optimal size of government, the question you have to ask yourself is, is it optimal that the government provides these things to the extent that it does? And of course, we do have a system where there's some hybrid, you know, not all elementary and secondary education is provided by the government currently, but a lot of it is, most of it is, some of it's provided privately. But do we have the right balance? And uh, what we're going to talk about, uh, you know, in, as we go on in this, in this talk is what, what are some of the considerations that would, that would determine uh, the right balance? All right, I want to shift to, uh, well, I'm going to go through what I think some of the main points are that uh, are usually put forward to justify government intervention. And, what are some of the main problems of government intervention? But I want to hear from some people, okay, what about this government has 100% share in the economy? So 100% income tax rate, every dollar that anybody earns, the government's going to take and they're going to pull that money and they're going to put that uh, to good use, or so they say. Yes, what's the problem? No private businesses. Right. Why would you run a private business if you knew that the government was just going to take 100 cents in every dollar that you earned? Yeah. Zero incentive for productive activity, also zero incentive to actually try hard in anything because you're not, you don't get to keep the fruits of your labors in any way. Yes? Uh, no incentive to innovate? No incentive to innovate because you're not going to be able to uh, enjoy the fruits of that innovation. Okay, what else? Yep. Right, we're going to have no price signals on anything because basically there's going to be no private market for anything. Okay, so that's good enough for now. So I think we see that there, there are problems with both of these. The question is where in the middle are we, are we going to land? Right now, in the United States, 44% of the economy is government spending. 
interesting, okay? I mean, I, I, I watched a video uh, by a Brazilian journalist who was talking about how he believed that the socialists in Brazil had uh, destroyed his country. And I went and looked up what government spending as a percent of GDP was in Brazil. It was 38%. So I'm, I think we, we just, I want to figure out where we, where we are, where, you know, what's the, what's the right, have we struck the right balance or not? So, so I'm going to go through a few things, many of which are things that you brought up. Um, in a bit of a systematic way. So the first thing is uh, rule of law, protection of private property, and the enforcement of private contracts. And just a really brief bit of sort of political economic history here. Um, you know, you've probably all uh, studied or heard about uh, uh, Hobbes and the state of nature, 1651. Uh, Hobbes wanted a, a certain type of, uh, of, of government or governor because he noticed that, uh, uh, you know, if you have so much um, chaos, uh, in the economy that there's going to be no place for industry because the fruit thereof is uncertain. What kind of governor did he want? What, what is that? Do you know what this is? Yeah, absolute monarch, the Leviathan. I guess this is what they thought a Leviathan would look like. I always thought of a Leviathan as a sea monster, but this is the kind of classic pi picture of the Leviathan. Um, and then we had, uh, you know, we had John Locke come along who had an answer who said, no, you know, government can actually be much more limited. It can be limited to just basically a few things, protecting natural rights, the rule of law, Protection of private property uh, through life, liberty, and possessions. Those are the key things that Locke said that, that people had a right to. And the government's role should be to protect those rights. So, um, and so certainly even, you know, I mean, I mean Locke is thought of as being, uh, as I mentioned last night, one of the founders of classical liberalism. So even fairly libertarian-minded people think that the government needs to be doing things to make sure that people can protect their life, liberty, and possessions, particularly through uh, protection of private property and enforcement of private contracts. So where does economics come into this? All right, this is political philosophy, but I'm going to fast forward to um, how economics has answered the question, how much do we need? And I'm just going to focus down onto one case, which is uh, this gentleman here, who is uh, uh, Ronald Coase, who uh, wrote something called The Problem of Social Cost. And maybe I'm just a, uh, somebody who's excessively enamored with the field of economics, but I think this is as important as Hobbes and Locke. So, um, so uh, Coase had just a great example that illustrates what he was uh, talking about in terms of the question of how much protection we need. I think this example just really kind of brings out the question of how much do we really need government stepping in to protect us about things. So um, his example is the following. So suppose that a doctor and a baker share an office buildings. They're, they have neighboring uh, uh, spaces. Uh, kind of funny to think of the baker in an office, but the, the idea is the baker's got his manufacturing uh, equipment in there, right? So uh, the baker's loud machinery disrupts the doctor, so the doctor cannot treat patients while the machine is running, all right? So that seems to be a problem. It's what we in economics would call an externality. So the old solution before Coase was, well, clearly there's a problem here. The baker is doing something bad. They're making a lot of noise. The doctor can't treat their patients, so we need laws. We need laws to protect, they should say, to the, the, the baker should compensate the, the doctor, and laws should be passed to protect people. So that's kind of how they... Uh, how they thought about it. Now, what did Coase say, right? Coase's solution was, you know what, we actually don't need laws. As long as it's legally clear and enforceable who has the right to control the noise level in the building, the parties will bargain to a solution, and it'll be an efficient solution. The only thing you need is you need courts that will enforce private contracts. So let's give an example here, all right? So suppose that uh, the baker could invest in quiet baking machinery, and that machinery costs $4,000, and soundproofing the doctor's office would cost $6,000. Coase would say, you know, as long as it's clear who has the right to determine the noise level in the building, the private economy can work this out. We don't need the government coming in and making ordinances about what times the baker can use his machine, or you know, we, don't, we don't need all these laws that are, that are trying to protect one party or the other. So uh, let's suppose that uh, the doctor had the right to determine uh, the noise in the building, noise level in the building. What would the private market outcome of this be? What would happen? What would the doctor do? That's right. The doctor would say to the baker, it's, you know, here's $4,000, right? Well, who, which way would it go? Yeah. Yes. Yep. 
So, you know, that's where the other conditions come in, right? Like negligible transaction costs, you're going to have to have full information about, the, about what's, what's going on, but this is, a, this is a setting where that's pretty clear, right? So actually, if the doctor has the right to determine the noise level in the building, then what's actually going to happen is the baker is going to have to invest the $4,000, okay, because the doctor has the, has the property rights. If the baker has the right to determine the noise level in the building, what's going to happen there? The doctor will pay the baker $4,000 to invest in the new equipment, and then there will be less noise in the building. So this is just a really simple example of how we often think that externalities in the economy have to be dealt with through uh, laws to protect somebody. But actually, externalities are often uh, dealt with by private parties, and they're dealt with effectively by private parties when we have enforcement of private contracts that works well in a system of, of law. So speaking of system of law, I have another poll for us. All right, so according to the Heritage Index of Economic Freedom, the country with the greatest judicial effectiveness score is. So this is a question. There's a uh, the, the Heritage Foundation puts together a list of uh, uh, which countries are most effective uh, on which measures. And one of the measures is judicial effectiveness. How uh, how effective are the are the are the courts as the entire judicial system? So uh, what do we think? So let's do some votes here. Just guess. Don't Google. You could Google the answer. Sure. I know you can Google. Everybody can Google. But just, just answer the question. Singapore, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, uh, New Zealand, or the United States of America? What do you think? Okay. 90 results in. We're going to wait until we get over 100. Okay, great. All right, good. So three, two, one. And we're going to end it. Okay. I'm going to lock them. I've learned my lesson. And then show the responses. All right. Singapore. Switzerland, United Kingdom, New Zealand, USA. Okay, it's kind of all over the place. Singapore got 40%, Switzerland 28%, New Zealand 18, USA 10. Uh, for some reason, United Kingdom people aren't very fond of the legal system there. Uh, let's see what what actually uh, is uh, is uh, is the is the, uh, the index. So Switzerland gets a 98 on this score. All right. Uh, New Zealand 95, United Kingdom uh, around 86, United States 77, and Singapore 58. So um, what, are the, what are the index determinants, all right? They are asking, is there an independent judiciary? Is there a due process in civil and criminal matters? Uh, what's the perceived quality of contract enforcement and property rights, um, and so on? And so some of the things, Switzerland's getting a lot of credit for having an independent judicial system uh, that's effective throughout the economy. They're getting a lot of credit for strong enforced intellectual property rights. The US is getting credit for some of that stuff, but they're getting dinged for politicized appointments. So we all know that there's a lot of, you know, a lot of the appointments of the, the, the judiciary goes through the executive branch, and the executive branch tends to do you know, appointments that may be politically motivated. So we've seen, seen that a lot over the past. And uh, you know, also this growing strength of the un unaccountable administrative state, uh, decisions that are being made by uh, agencies of the federal government or of state and local governments that weren't really elected, uh, you know, elected entities. So they're getting dinged a lot for that. Um, and uh, Singapore got dinged pretty heavily for uh, bias, bias towards the government in politically sensitive cases. So that if you, know, you sue the government in Singapore, uh, you're very unlikely to win. Or if the government sues you, uh, then you're very likely, uh, also very unlikely to win. Uh, okay, so that's one one you know sort of reason for the, for 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 government intervention. What what we need at least some intervention to create courts and a property system of property that's going to work. All right, next one, um, the social safety net, poverty alleviation. So the United States has played a increasing anti-poverty role over time. So this is your for your U.S. history. You know you learned about the New Deal, um, the Social Security Act, which created Social Security, uh, unemployment insurance, and so on. There, were another, another, there was another big wave of social security net creation in the 1960s with Johnson's War on Poverty and the Great Society. Uh, the second Social Security Act of 1965, which created Medicare and Medicaid, these public medical programs. Um, child tax credit introduced in 1997 with expansion. So it's kind of been an ever-increasing social security net. What you have to keep in mind and what I want to introduce here is the fact that incentives are an issue people do consider their marginal tax rates in deciding whether to work or whether to work more. One big example of that is labor force participation has not recovered from the COVID-19 crisis. I'll show you some numbers on that in a minute. Why is that? What role did government play? So let's look at some of the evidence about the social safety net and its incentive effects on people's decision to work. So the first piece of evidence is from uh, Casey Mulligan of the University of Chicago. And this is about the, uh, the global financial crisis. This is a, the, 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 our previous crisis, our previous era, and the big government expansion of unemployment insurance that happened there. And uh, during that time, the, the federal government increased the number of weeks that you were eligible for unemployment from 52 weeks to 72 weeks to 96 weeks. 
So you could take an unemployment check for almost two years. They also did what's called a modernization of the unemployment insurance eligibility criteria, which uh, they, is a translation, a sort of euphemism for relaxing it to include some quitting of your job, that you can actually quit your job and get the unemployment insurance, which you, you couldn't do before, but now you can under some circumstances. And they also changed the way that food stamps are given out so that there's no more asset test on food stamps. So uh, somebody who's got uh, uh, you know, su sufficient assets or significant assets in the bank, but is not earning an income, uh, will be able to get food stamps. Uh, and Casey Mulligan calculated that what this did was it raised the marginal tax rate to as high as 60% for low-income workers. So how does this work? Th think about it this way. Suppose that you're on unemployment insurance, and that unemployment insurance is paying you 200 bucks a week, and you're unemployed, and you're sitting there and you're collecting 200 bucks a week. Then suppose someone comes along and offers you a job, and that job pays $400 a week. Well, you face a 50% tax rate, because if you take the job, you're gonna lose your $200. And so even though it's time limited, in this case, it was time limited to as much as two years, you're gonna to say to yourself, gee, you know, it's, it may not be worth it for me if I'm gonna get a 50% tax on my earnings. That, that 200 extra bucks that I'm earning each week, man, I mean, I'm gonna to have to spend money on gas to get to the job. Uh, I'm gonna to have to maybe buy more food outside of the house rather than cook at home. It might just not be worth it. And evidence suggests, actually, that these benefit programs do have a pretty big effect on labor supply. So this is one of my favorite economics studies. It examines a 16-week reduction in UI benefits in uh, one state that was implemented in uh, 2011. And basically what you see is that it happened in April 2011. People who claimed unemployment insurance uh, right before that change, they ended up being unemployed for a much longer time than people who claimed right after that change. And it wasn't just about being cut off at the end, that 16-week cutoff. They were less, they were more likely to be still receiving, uh, or the less likely to still be receiving unemployment insurance and, and, and more likely to be employed, uh, you know, one week, two weeks, 10 weeks, 15 weeks, all the additional uh, weeks. So, so that people really do actually respond to, um, to these programs when determining whether they're going to go back to work or not. Makes you think. Um, third example of this is uh, what we saw during the COVID crisis. The CARES Act of March 2020. Uh, this was passed a couple weeks after I uh, left the Council of Economic Advisors. The CARES Act created an additional $600 per week unemployment insurance benefit. It also expanded unemployment insurance in a variety of different ways so that people could collect unemployment uh, insurance who otherwise previously were not eligible for it. And uh, some researchers also at the University of Chicago calculated a median replacement rate of 145%. So that meant that someone with a job if they left that job, they would actually get a 45% pay raise just by leaving the job and collecting unemployment insurance. How could that not affect your decision to work? There was a lot of confusing stuff going on at the time because people, you know, we, there was a, this, the pandemic was happening, people were saying, well, maybe I don't want to work, that, that's all valid. But how could it not have had an effect that people would be earning 45% more money by just staying at home and not doing anything rather than, going, rather than going to work? And the macro evidence shows that there was substantial depressed labor force participation and also, as John Cochrane mentioned, high savings rates during this time. These graphs just show differences in this, uh, uh, this replacement rate by different uh, income brackets and also by different, uh, by different professions. So, uh, you know, sales and retail, medical assistance, these people all uh, were, were earning more, uh, would earn more by staying home than by working, and substantially more by staying home than working, 50, 50, 50, 55 percent according to this graph. Okay, so, uh, and as I mentioned, yeah, so here, here's the kind of the macro data. Uh, the personal savings rate spiked up and the labor force participation tanked, and this is March 2020, exactly when these programs went in. The labor force participation went down is maybe not that surprising given that a lot of the response to COVID was just people getting f frightened and freaked out and the private economy responded. But the savings rate, I mean, look at that savings rate spikes up a lot. And then you see that it's been very slow. The, the, the labor force participation rate's been very slow to recover. We're still nowhere near back to where we were from before COVID. And all this, uh, these spikes here, this, this is money that was saved. And so people are still working working through that, uh, that saving. It uh, uh, suggests that government policy really played a role in keeping people out of the labor force. Mm -hmm.